Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at another game between Alpha Zero and Stockfish. In this game, Alpha Zero is playing as Black. E4, E5 game. Roy Lopez, Berlin defense. D3, Bishop C5. Minor piece imbalance is now present. Castles, Knight D7. So we're six moves in. Of the ten games that have been released to the public, two of them, Alpha Zero, played as Black. And in both of those games, uh, we had this same exact position. So when Stockfish plays the Roy Lopez, apparently Alpha Zero is a fan of the Berlin defense. What does this mean? Well, maybe it'll have some influence on the top players of the world. Might the Berlin defense become more popular? I guess we'll have to wait on that. Now, in the other game between these two, Stockfish continued with a central expansion. In this one, it's knight b to d2. Castles, queen e1, f6, and knight c4. So from e1, a couple ideas behind this move. For one, f4 is desirable, so the queen may later look to come out towards the king's side. And another, from e1, she is facilitating some uh, queenside expansion. So anticipating this punch against the bishop, we have rook f7. This idea to vacate f8 is common. Uh, both the knight or the bishop can make use of that square. But to play the rook to f7 instead of e8, which I feel is more natural, you know, it definitely caught my attention. So I just want to share a, a thought or two with these two posts. Uh, for one, maybe with the rook on f7, the queen wants to at some stage come to e8 and do similar, like the white queen. And another, if at some stage the d file becomes relevant, or there's some target for black to attack. Now the rooks can form a battery in just two moves. Again, just some rough thoughts, but whenever I see some kind of, you know, something that strikes me as a little bit off, I question things. These are, this is what I do. Continuing, a4, bishop f8, white is getting off of this diagonal, wants to play f4, so the king in the corner is much more secure if you're going to play f4. Knight c5, a5, knight e6, and you know what? There might even be one other detail behind rook f7, and I know this one's going to be really far out there, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Maybe it is to bait Stockfish into the following sacrifice. Knight takes e5 follows. Pawn takes knight, knight takes pawn, and the rook is hit. He wouldn't be hit if he was on e8. Again, I don't know these things for certain. I'm just throwing them out there. Make what you want of them. Is this a justified sacrifice? Let's see what follows. Black, uh, white just sacrificed a knight and got two pawns for it. Rook f6 follows, knight g4. Rook f7, knight e5. Does this look familiar? We've been here before. How many times is this going to repeat? If the rook goes to f6, basically we're headed for a threefold repetition draw. Alpha zero says, no. Play ball. This is a very awkward post for the rook, for sure. Interfering with the bishop and the queen. A little uncoordinated, but the game continues. Black wants more. A6 follows. So I already pointed out, white gave up a knight, got two pawns, but is also now getting a little bit more as well. What is this? Well, the black queenside structure is going to be very weakened. With a6, this is putting a dent in black's queenside. Without the b pawn around, the c pawns, the a pawn, become very weak. You can't take him because of knight takes c6 with the fork. c5 is played. f4, queen e8. Okay, so now black is prepared to not take the pawn here, but rather maintain 
a uh, or acquire, let's say, a very strong queenside structure with b6. Now that c6 is defended. So that's why at this point we have a takes b, bishop takes, and many weaknesses on the queen side now. Black is not too well coordinated here. Continuing, queen a5. White has some very active pieces. The bishop and the king rook are not really contributing just yet, but definitely the major pieces on the a-file and the knight that is in black's house. Knight d4. That's defended with the queen. On uh, queen takes pawn move, there's this tactical shot of rook takes knight. Queen takes knight, rook c5. The black pieces uh, make use of the c5 square with this variation. Uh, black is giving up a pawn, but again has c5 for the rook. Maybe even the bishop in some cases. Queen c3 in the game. Rook e6. Bishop e3. Rook b6. So this, for the moment, is tying down the queen to the defense of the pawn. Knight c5, rook b4. b3. a5. So this was uh, another moment in the game I thought, a5, what is that about? White is giving up a pawn with this move. Where is the compensation? So, in order to see that this compensation, you have to question a couple of things. One, what pieces get exchanged after this? Chop, chop. What just happened with that sequence? Well, this is a very active rook. And this guy here, Black's rook, is passive. There's some compensation. Active rook exchange for a passive rook. Bishop takes knight. Rook takes bishop. Knight c4 and rook d8 follows. So this backwards move is actually a developing move. The rook wants to be here. There's no action in the center. It's, it's not like it's, it's a knight on d4. Much different. Uh, the rook doesn't function well on d4. And knight would. The rook wants to be on a8. Continuing, both sides produce a flight square now. G3 and now H6. So these are the two flight squares. This definitely caught my attention. Stockfish's choice to play G3 here. More common, I, I thought, would be uh, to play H3. Have uh, the H2 square as a pocket. It's much more secure against a major piece getting to the second rank. Uh, what's a difference? With g3, well, yes, the king is more vulnerable to major piece pressure on the second rank, but at the same time, at least f4 is secure. Okay, The rook doesn't want to stay here babysitting the pawn forever. He wants to be able to go over to the a file, the open file. That's a difference between these two moves, h3 and g3. You can be sure if f4 wasn't defended by the rook, you know, if h3 was in, Black's going to put pressure on this sensitive point one way or the other. So after h6, we have queen a5. She doesn't have to watch over that c2 point anymore. Bishop took out that knight, so the queen is now very active, hitting both bishop and pawn. Bishop c8. These guys are now very well organized. The bishops are back home, and... Nice harmony. Black gives up a pawn with this last move. The material is restored. White has three pawns. And black has the bishop. Black has the bishop pair. And they're going to cause the white king a serious problem. This is one of the benefits with having the bishop pair. Where is there a safe color for the enemy king to now go to? The bishops are always able to question the king's post. Go to a light square, we got the light square bishop around. Dark square, dark square bishop. So where is the safe home? Bishop h3 follows. The rook is hit. The g2 square, the flight square, is now taken away from the king. And the rook would really like to go to the open file. But he can't do that. He has to make a very passive move. 
Rook G1 is played. If the rook goes to the open file, the queen now sneaks into F3, or even E2. So, what does rook G1 do? How is that a defense of this move? Well, if queen H5, there's this G4 advance, interfering with the queen getting to F3. And keep in mind, if the queen plays to H5 here, this rook is vulnerable. So first we have rook D7. So changing of the guard. The bishop now has this responsibility. So the queen is now free to do some other things. Queen H5 is now the threat. Queen E5. Welcoming a queen exchange and preventing queen h5. So the queens are now gone. The rook definitely gets over to the open file. Where does he really want to be? a2, to exert pressure on the weakest pawn in white's camp, c2. Knight c4 follows. This is move 35 and one that I stared at for quite some time. What you're seeing on screen right now is that the recommendation by Stockfish Aid is rook to c1. And as soon as the move knight c4 is played, you see a big shift with the evaluation. It was equal-ish. I'm just going to go back. It's equal-ish with rook to c1. But after knight c4 is played, there's a big, you know, a big difference with those two moves. So I let it sit and think for a little bit. And once I got to about depth 36, 37 area, uh, those, these two moves here, knight c4 and rook c1, were much closer in evaluation. And in both cases, it was about a minus 0.7 right around that area. So why is knight c4 played is the big question. In order to understand this, let's see what would happen if rook c1 is played. The top move, Stockfish thinks, is g5 at depth 28, 29 right now, 30. But instead of g5, there's something even better that black can do. And that would be the move c4. A pawn sacrifice in order to do what? Cause the white king a giant headache. Bishop c5 would follow. How is the king getting out? killer bishops. If white tries to negate the bishop, no. The bishop slips into f2, and soon you're also going to have the rook slipping in to the second rank. How would white defend this? I want to play it out just a few more moves to show the type of bind black can place white in, and eventually this bishop can dislodge the knight with this little maneuver, these pawns are guarding a lot, are controlling a lot of ground. But it does this whole side of the board, let's say these five ranks, who cares about these five ranks? This right here is where the action is, and this is where black has all the pieces, and the king is stuck in the corner. Talk about completely defensive pieces on the white end. Short story, knight c4 prevents black from vacating the c5 square to the bishop. Continuing, g5, rook c1. White wants to get the king playing very soon, so the rook goes here, anticipating some rook a2 move. Bishop g7, the bishop wants to get to d4. White says no. Rook a8, this was instructive. I think many would just jump right into a2, but from a8, the rook is super flexible. From a8, this stops the idea of the king trying to get active with king g1, king f2. If king g1 in this position, black could capture and then put pressure here, and there's no defense to that threat. So what's tried is knight f3, bishop b2, bishop c3, knight g1. Trying to dislodge this pesky bishop. Capturing once 
allows the rook to attack the knight. And if then the knight goes back here, uh, there's going to be an issue. Let's just play this one variation out. Rook f8, knight g1 can be met with bishop to f1, and then rook to f2, the black pieces are invading. In the game, it's knight g1, bishop d7, knight e2, bishop d2, rook d1, bishop e3. He's secure for at least a move now. He was hit a couple times, back to back there, both knight and rook. He's secure here, no way to get on him directly now. King g2, now the light square bishop comes right back in. Look at how well coordinated they are, taking away multiple squares from the king, the knight, and the rook. The knight's in a pin. Rook e1. And bishop to d2. Rook f1 is the move played in the game. Playing here, there would be a cool tactic. Rook to d1. Can you spot the tactic? If you'd like to, go ahead and pause the video. What move would black play in this position? Okay, the winning shot would be to simply capture on f4. And if rook takes bishop, f3 with the nice fork, and then soon black is going to be promoting. So, in the game it's rook f1, rook a2, h3, bishop takes knight, and black is going to lose that piece back, but at least gets a pawn. Material is still balanced, but uh, these two guys here restrict these four pawns, and then some. So this bishop helps out controlling these four pawns, and also plays a role on the king side as well. Has some influence on these squares. So rook f2, king g7, g4, and now bishop to d4. So the rook has two tasks, or is trying to perform these two tasks. One, stop the king from approaching the center, and two, defend the pawn. Bishop d4 says, choose one. So the rook defends the pawn. King f6, and e5. This is basically the last uh, point in the game to touch on. e5 is giving away a pawn to try and activate the king, but black can just pick up the pawn and question the king's position. Even if he gets here, he can be boxed out by the king. So playing out a few more moves. The rook has ideas of maybe coordinating on the g3 square. So bishop f4. c3 is only creating more targets for the black rook. Again, there's this idea of rook to e3 and getting into g3. So this is these pawns are now just going to drop one by one. With this last move, now all three are targets. White was already struggling to defend the one base point, so there's no defense when there's now three different targets for Team Black. So these pawns simply fall one by one from here, and not too long off from this stage, we're going to have Team White throw in the towel after move 67, bishop to d6. Stockfish resigns now. If it did continue, this is one of the many ways it could have finished up. The pawn's getting all captured, and this guy here on the g-file continuing to push, and straight to a pretty cool mate with bishop to e3. So, what more to add with this game? Stockfish, your knight sacrifice in exchange for my two pawns was not completely justified. Moreover, the synergy of my bishop pair demonstrated that your king could not obtain a safe haven. If your knight sacrifice was played to ultimately secure a draw by threefold repetition, well, the great Mikhail Tal could not approve of such. Tal said, quote, To play for a draw, at any rate with white, is to some degree a crime against chess, end quote. 